Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our jam session. I do want to let everyone know that we are recording this session. So if you want to stay um, muted and camera off, that is fine. If you would like to take your camera off and ask some questions here at the end, we will welcome you to do that as well. But just wanted to give you a heads up that we are recording the session. So welcome to Rebalancing Your Academic Life Study Strategies Edition. I am Hannah Sollenberger and I work as the Associate Dean here in the Office of Academic Advising and Student Support Services. And with me today is one of my fantastic colleagues. Hi, I'm Sharon Warrington, and I also work in the Office of Academic Advising and Student Support Services as an academic coach. So as we get started today, one of the things that we're going to talk about first is our agenda. So basically, I'm going to talk to you about how to create and maintain some healthy, successful habits, um, basically how to get yourself prepared to study. And then Sharon's going to introduce some proven study skills that we know um, work for many of our students. And then we do have um, a set of students here, um, actually three students of various um, class years to join us and sharing their perspective at the end. So some of the benefits of creating some solid work habits um, when we are um, looking at creating new habits and how to increase our study sessions. Um, the fact that you all showed up today is a really good sign that you're motivated and ready um, to have a successful spring semester. So that's part one. The hard part about building habits is that habits can be difficult to start and sometimes they're even harder to maintain. Um, the good thing about building solid work habits is that they become part of your routine. Um, and that routine has many benefits, as you can see here on this list, that far outweigh the hard work and dedication that it takes to maintain those. Um, and then you also quickly see that they you know, have advantages. And these are just a list of some of the advantages when we're creating solid work habits um, and increasing that study time. So a couple of the things that go into creating positive work habits, um, we have physical space, which we'll look into with mental space, our organization and our communication. So as we're building these, we need to realize that there's this pre mid and post COVID changes that we might all face this coming spring semester causes us to adjust our habits, um, such as our workspaces and when we adjust those habits, that doesn't mean stop our routines or stop trying. It just means that we have to adjust them, but that they should still be happening. And some of our students might be able to share some good perspective on that at the end. Um, but the fact that we wanna be successful, we have to keep growing and changing and adjusting as the time goes. So as you're building these habits, if you find something isn't working, change it. If you find something is working when you are doing your first week of Zoom classes, and then the next week goes to in-person. Don't stop those things that you realized already in the first week of class that are working. Don't change those things. Those are the things that we want you to keep doing regardless of the fact that you're going from Zoom classes the first week to in-person the next week. We want you to be able to adjust as we go. So when we look at physical space, um, we want to think about setting up that study space and a designated work and class space, um, such as not zooming or working from your bed. That's not a designated workspace. It's not going to set you up to have a good balanced study space. So we need you to really think about that when you're making um, your room changes. When you get to campus in January, we want you to talk to your roommates and your friends setting up a space that you know is going to be a good study space for you. Um, the next, and I talked about this a little bit last week at our uh, first session, is putting your phone away, turning notifications off, really being engaged in class from day one. So regardless of the fact that you might not be looking at your professor, your instructor face to face that first day of class, doesn't mean that we want you to start distracted. That's not a good way to start. Um, it's not going to set you up to be successful as far as how am I going to study and be engaged and focused. So we really want you to try to eliminate those distractions. Um, one of the, the things that we always tell students is that participation is a, a large portion of many of the grades here on campus. So if you want your participation grade, you have to be engaged from day one. And the only way to do that is if we're not distracted. 
Um, the next thing is to get organized, and we'll talk about this later on as well, but it really sets the tone for the semester. You know, gathering all your materials, attending every single class, going to class prepared. Um, those are all the things that are going to set the stage for you to be successful in this spring semester um, and really prove to yourself that you're ready to kind of, as we say, do college. We want you to be prepared and ready and on the right foot um, and very organized. So in the last one um, for the physical space is the, the exercise, fresh air, even though it's going to be cold air, is very helpful to keep our brains awake and alert. Um, take the breaks as you need them when you're studying. Um, when you realize that you're no longer being focused, change it up. Go outside for fresh air, take a short break, whatever you need to do to refresh and get focused. Um, we all realize most of the time when we're getting unfocused and distracted, that's not our best time to study. Um, so when you realize you're getting to that point, make a change, make a shift. So as far as our mental space, like I said, the fact that you're here today on a Monday afternoon shows that you are already halfway there for your mental space, right? You're preparing already for spring and spring semester doesn't start until the 17th. So the fact that you're here on the 10th is a really great sign. Um, so did you check your syllabus yet? Have you gone online and looked on Moodle? Um, have you bought textbooks? Um, have you looked at your spring schedule? Did you attend the time management workshop last week and really look at your spring schedule and what you're really dealing with? Those are all things that you can be doing now. We're a week from classes starting. That does not mean that you don't need to prepare mentally. And that's going to cut out all of that time that you would be spending doing that the first week of class. Instead, if you do it now, you'll be really ready to start engaging in the class material and learn what you need to learn that first week. Routines. Um, I am definitely a routine oriented person, but I didn't come to college being routine oriented person, I learned to be a routine oriented person in college. So um, routines help us prepare for learning. So for example, if you're getting materials ready for your class each day, gathering supplies, thinking about what you'll be learning, look at the syllabus and find out, figure out what you're talking about um, that day in class that helps you mentally prepare and study and prepare for what you're going to be learning in class that day. We want you to be ready to learn. So develop that routine for classes. Um, designating blocks of time also helps for study time. Um, I mentioned this last week as well, but the study time and leisure time should be different, right? We have our, our work mode and our fun mode. And sometimes they mix if you're having a group project or something where they can overlap, but for the most part, you're either studying or you're hanging out with friends. It can't be both. You could study with a friend across the table from a friend, but you can't be hanging out with friends while you study for an exam. Um, those are two totally different things. So if you're studying with a friend, as in actually studying with a friend, going over no cards, materials, teaching each other, that's a different type of study. So we really need to designate those blocks of time and make sure that we know the difference um, and making sure that we can say no when we need, to, this is my designated study time. Um, and I think some of our students can attest to that. Um, I can hang out later. Um, if you wanna come study with me, you can, um, but this is my study time and I, I can't um, distract myself. So in reviewing your, um, your study schedule for the week, um, I like to do it on Sunday nights personally, but looking at what's coming up, I hear from students all the time that I didn't know we were having a quiz or I forgot the exam was this week. That can never happen, right? So when you're in school or when you get a job after college, that kind of thing can never happen. You just didn't, you know, a surprise deadline. Now a pop quiz is a little bit different, but there should be no surprises. We want you to have a designated time where you review your schedule, you really look at what's coming up, you look at when you're gonna be studying and factor those things into your schedule. If we don't make time for the studying, it just won't happen. So we have to really be intentional, one of my favorite words. We have to be intentional about when we're factoring those in. So if we're reviewing every at the end of each week, do you have any exams? If you're having a slow week, I will tell you, Sharon would probably tell you the same thing. There is no such thing as a slow week. So if you're having a slow week, that means next week is probably really busy. So take this slow week, even that first week of class, there's a lot happening, but you might not have any actual assessments. That's your time to be preparing for that first 
first exam that might happen the second or third week of class. So there really isn't any downtime, uh, but it doesn't happen unless we really review our schedule and we're prepared. So an example of that is this is an example of someone's schedule. I think um, they're even on this call, um, but this is an example of someone's schedule. Uh, and what I mean by reviewing this week at a glance, um, when we're looking at this student's schedule, and I would like all of you to do this before the 17th, where am I gonna study? So if I have an exam in sociology on Thursday afternoon at 110, what am I gonna study? It can't be on Thursday between 10 and one. That can't might be a nice time to review or, or touch up on things, but I have to build that time in. So for exams, papers, and also just for readings and for homework assignments, I have to build that time in because it won't just magically happen. Right. So all of these day hours, I like to call them our day working hours. All of this time here is time that we can, if we have set it aside, that we can work on things. Um, and we really dove into that last week about how to really navigate that and, and how to prioritize what you're putting in. But when you're thinking about study times, it's the same thing. So, for example, this student has an, a class that goes all the way till 930 on Wednesday evening. If they have an exam or a quiz or a paper due on Thursday, the time to work on that is not Wednesday after class. You can just prepare yourself that you know Wednesday is going to be a long day. For you, you're not likely to want to study for anything when you get back at 930, or that won't be your best study time likely if you're tired. So everyone has a different schedule. So everyone needs to do what is best for you when you're planning this out. So what works for you is not necessarily going to be what works for someone else, but we have to think of head. So I might not have any exams this week, but I know I have one Monday. So that means this weekend is my study time, right? And so I can block off some day working hours, but I'm really going to ne need to dedicate some time over the weekend as well. So that's where it comes into, it's not rocket science, but it's getting you into the mentality that like skipping class is not an option, going late to an exam is not an option. All of these things have to be prioritized and make sure that we have those designated study times. Um, and a lot of times students don't start studying for something until two days before an exam. The time to start studying, I always say, is the first day of class. Each one of these class periods has valuable information and it usually builds on each other, right? So when you are done with week one, review what happened week one in preparation for week two. Don't wait until week six because you will have already forgotten what happened week one. So we have to be doing this in increments as we go. And that's where Sharon's gonna dive more into that. But when we're looking at our week at a glance, we have to factor in where do I personally have time to make my study a priority. So as far as organization, and this is really what we talked a lot about last week, so I'm just going to be brief on this. Um, finding a schedule that works for you is super important. Um, getting organized, our, we are bombarded right now with digital information. Um, archive old emails or old work assignments, make new folders for your new classes, making sure that you are ready to study, you're ready to go to class, you have yourself organized, um, buying your books beforehand, making sure you're factoring in all of the responsibilities that you have outside of academics as well, um, and be intentional about that organization. You have a week until classes start. So really using this next week to get prepared and promise yourself that this semester is gonna be your best one yet. So communication, um, like I said about being bombarded by information, we have an influx of communication that we need to do throughout the semester. And our best way to manage that flow is from the very beginning. So I know it's very easy to get overwhelmed with assignments. It's easy to get overwhelmed with papers. It's easy to get overwhelmed with preparation for exams. What we want you to do is to manage that from the start because that's really the only way that you're going to have to make time and have time in order to study and to put some of the strategies that Sharon's going to explain to you into good use. We're really going to need you to do that early, not waiting until week eight when you're already overwhelmed, maybe have one poor exam score under your belt and now 
now you start to worry. So we want you to manage all of this communication and organization prior to that so that you stay in control for when it comes time to studying. So, and the last thing on my list is really, what does it mean to study efficiently and effectively? We say it all the time, we hear people, people really talk about it, um, but there's really three parts, the way we see it on how you study effectively, and it's being focused, being planned, and being effective. Um, and really knowing when you've stopped being effective, so you can take a break if you need to, or go eat something if you need to, or stop for the day and go to sleep. But when you notice that you've stopped being focused, um, that's when you need to take a break. But none of this happens without being planned. Um, and that's really where this first part comes, that it's not just going to magically happen. Even once you know how to study, you have to know when your best study time is, how to factor that in. Um, all of that is, is it comes together. Um, the, we can't really look at them as separate entities. These are things that we do collectively. If we have good habits, we've built those routines that makes us more effective and efficient with our time. So we all have the same number of hours in the day and we can't use it all studying, right? So we have to figure out where that balance is. Um, and so we can really function with our overall and cognitive health. And now I will turn it over to Sharon. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, we're gonna cover three main topics under this top un under study strategies. I'm gonna try and be, do this in a very timely way because I want our students, to, the uh, panel to have an opportunity to share their wonderful expertise also. But I have to warn you, this is some of my very favorite stuff. And I can get a little excited and a little uh, windy when it comes to talking about brain research. But to make it as succinct as I can, we've divided it into three main parts. We're gonna discuss a multi-sensory approach to taking in information in a manner that is consistent with the way our brains function and take in and process information. I'm gonna to demonstrate to you also some specific study methods that you can implement immediately to boost up the effectiveness of your study time and your long-term memory storage. And lastly, um, I wanna share some tips for you on some very specific different types of exams that you routinely experience at Gettysburg College. Before we look at um, anything else, I want to remind you all that, Hannah, can you go back? There you go, thanks. Um, I wanna remind you all that the word studying is a verb and verbs are action words. We all learned that by third grade. Action words mean we have to be doing something. So to be actively engaged in studying, you are actively doing something. Also, the more ways we take in information, the more likely we are to retain that information and store it into our long-term memories for usage and application, which is what we're asked to do on college exams, apply what we know. So the first one, um, that I wanna to talk to you about is to read. This one, most people come to college with this in place. We read all of our textbook assignments, articles that are given to us, study guides, any course materials that are provided. Reading is part of the visual spatial loop in taking in information into our brain. That's a really important component. It is not enough. A lot of students come into my office and I'll ask them what they're study, how they study. And they're like, oh, I look over some things. That may have worked in high school, but it is a passive study strategy. It is not going to work in college. So it's a great place to start the doing the reading, but we have to continue on with our intake of information. You will always notice if you come to my office, I have a pen or a pencil in my hand. As you are studying, when you're reading your materials, you should also be writing. This part is only for you. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't even have to be spelled correctly. You don't even have to write the whole word if you don't want to, but it needs to be meaningful to you. The writing component is a tactile experience. It's a kinesthetic experience. We are now engaging our muscles. 
It is also important because it helps us to connect to our prior knowledge. When you're writing, you should be putting the information in your own words. This is activating your prior knowledge with combined with the new information. And that is what learning is, taking in new information, connecting it to what we already have stored and reconfiguring what is in our long-term memory. Writing also um, helps us to be able to reinforce things that we do not necessarily have stored. So I'm gonna tell you a secret. I wish it were a foolproof plan because if this were, I would be very, very rich you know, somewhere on an exotic island and probably not doing this workshop. But the secret is if you write something three times, you own it. So if there's a piece of information you cannot remember, you write it, you cover it, you write it again, you cover it, you write it again and you cover it. Maybe you have to do that three, three to separate times, but that is a very helpful way to secure information. This is not a step that should be uh, skipped. I'm gonna, and I think most people are on board with that. The next one is where I, I get some pushback. The next thing you should be doing in your multi-sensory strategies is talking. I know people think talking to yourself is a bad thing. That is not correct. Talking to yourself is a good thing and you can tell everybody I said so. If I have people talking to themselves all over campus. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go into the library and have a conversation with yourself in a conversational tone, because yes, people are going to look at you funny if you do that. But it doesn't mean you can't be going over verbally information under your breath or whispering or quietly. If you are studying alone in your room or you find an empty classroom, you can take this particular strategy and you can sing, you can shout, you can do whatever you need to do to articulate the information and explain it to yourself. And this activates the listening, which is part of the phonological loop that activates auditory learning. Now, the talking component is also super, super important because it activates the highest form of learning. If you look at the hierarchy of learning, at the very, very bottom is rote memorization. This is what most of us got through high school, high school on. We crammed as much information into our brains as we possibly could, hoped that we could hold it there to go in, regurgitate it on the test, walk out the door and forget everything. Sound familiar? Probably. The highest form of learning at the top of the hierarchy is actually teaching. When you can teach or explain something to yourself or to someone else, you have mastered that material. You have that stored in long-term memory. I always tell my students when they first come to see me and we talk about these four components of studying, I learned more about, te about math when I had to teach math to other people than I learned any time from kindergarten through college, because I had to take that information and articulate it and explain it in a manner in which other people could understand. That is what the benefit of the talk or recite portion of the study strategies is. It's a very, very powerful component. As I said, it leads into the activation of your phonological loop. This is the other way that we take in information in our brains. This is allows you to hear. It reinforces yet another way we're taking in information. We're using our visual spatial. We're using our, our, our muscle movement on our kinesthetics. We're thinking through and articulating into words what these Inf information means using our prior knowledge. And we are again hearing it for ourselves as we explain and articulate verb verbally what is happening in the process of information in our minds. The key to the success of the read, write, talk, listen is that we use these 
all the time. We use them in routine studying. We use them in exam preparation study sessions. It's, it's great to know about them, but the implementation is key to the success. So let's look at how we do that. If we look at how we do this on a routine basis, Dean uh, Stallenberger and I tell people over and over and over again, starting studying starts on day one, which means next Monday, January 17th, you start your routine study plan. If you wanna really maximize what you're doing in that routine and boost your memory, you use the read, write, talk, listen into this routine. This happens before class, it happens during class, and it happens after class. You're going to talk your way and explain through your reading assignments and your written assignments that you are assigned from your professors for each class session you meet. You know there's usually a, the reading, reading assignments across the board are very, 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 very common. Um, sometimes there's written assignments that you have to have completed for class time. So that is important. Most of us are good at this part. It's the homework portion of our routine. Going to class, during class, we should be actively focused, actively engaged. That means you should be taking and recording notes during your lectures. So now you're engaging it with your, the information that is being articulated from your professors. As you heard Hannah say, participation is a huge component of a lot of the grades that you receive. So you should be engaged in any discussions that are occurring in class and be participating in any forums. If it's small groups or breakouts, breakout sessions within class, you should be participating in those as well, immersing and engaging actively in the content that is being covered during that class time. The last routine portion of this is your after class. And this is the piece that students miss the most. And I would argue is one is probably the most important part. This is where you marry everything together. After class, you wanna review and recite your notes. This is also your opportunity to expand on your notes. Things that you did not catch or get completely or get thoroughly explained in your notes during the lecture, while it's fresh in your mind and you can remember it, you can, uh, you can expand those notes for that class. It's a brief review of what just happened. And it's also a great place to prepare with your before class, before your next class, to review what happened last, last class and get your head ready for new information coming in the following course meeting. Moving to, and I often call that um, a study loop. And I think you may hear some of that from some of our students in our student panel a little bit later on because you're constantly looping before, during and after class reviews into your routine schedule. But we do have to set aside additional time to prepare for exams that are coming up. So I wanna to talk to you about um, some specific methods that are successful and are based on brain research. They would be concept cards or Quizlet equivalency. Some people prefer the electronic component, uh, foldable concept pages and graphic organizer, the KW graphic organizer, what you know and want to know. So let's start with the good old fashioned concept cards. These are the resurrection, yes, of the infamous flashcards you used in high school. Most people start studying for college using the high school flashcard. Word on the front, definition on the back. And most of us learn the hard way that this is not enough preparation for a college exam. So we need to bump it up and get it ready for a college exam. So the concept card has been developed. So on the front of your card goes your concept. On the back of the card, yes, start with definition. 
but the college exams are application exams. It's not good enough to not simply know the information on a factual basis. You have to know how to apply and use the information in new scenarios on the exams themselves. So you should have an extension of the definitions with descriptions, explanations, examples, usage, application. This is where the who, the what, the whens, the wheres, the whys go. So if your concept is photosynthesis, you should have on there, what is it? Yes, define photosynthesis. How does it occur? When does it occur? What are, the, what are its effects on the ecosystem? What are broader impa impacts into the climate? Anything at all that you have talked about, learned about, it found information on, on that topic should be included on the back of that card. Also, people like the um, concept cards because again, they have a hard copy and a tactile experience. Read, write, talk, listen is very easily applied with a flashcard if you do it with somebody else or you do it with yourself. A lot of people like the Quizlets. Um, nothing wrong with Quizlet, they have great application. I'm, I don't think you get quite the same experience in the typing mode as you do in the actual writing mode, but it's not a deal breaker. What I really do love about Quizlet and I can really get behind is the ability to do um, mock exams. So if you know you're gonna have a multiple choice and a true and false exam, you can create sample tests for yourself in there. And I think that's a really great study tool to use. So if you prefer Quizlet, you go for it. I never try to talk anybody out of that. There's nothing wrong with Quizlet. It is a solid um, form for studying. If you're not a big fan of having the concept cards and a whole bunch of loose cards with rubber bands around them, um, you can take the same methods and apply it to a foldable. A foldable is um, a piece of paper, either loose or in a notebook, either one is fine, and you fold it. So on the outside goes the concept. If you like loose sheets of paper, you can keep them all like this in a nice organized stack with a clip. You can also create a study notebook for yourself with the paper attached and you still fold it in, concept on the outside, all the content information you need on the inside. Same um, application information applies with the the expansion of examples and ex explanations, usage, the reasons why things happen when they happen, um, all the details that you need to be able to thoroughly explain a concept and apply a concept. So that doesn't change. The last method I wanna share with you today is a KW organizer. Graphic organizers are great for studying and there's an endless supply of them. If you Google, graphic organizers, you'll be inundated with different options. This is one of my favorites. The reason there are so many organizers is because our brain loves to compartmentalize and organize information. It helps us process faster and it helps us retain it in long-term memory storage. So the KW No Want to Know, um, again, is a folded piece of paper concept of what it is you need to know goes on the outside. If it's loose or attached, you can create this for yourself on a tea table electronically. If you prefer, it doesn't matter. Either one is fine. When you, what you have on the inside is a tea table made with the fold. On the left-hand side, you have the, the, the K. What do I know? On the far right side, you would have the W. What do I want to know? So you start with, on the left side, recording everything you know on a topic. So if it's photosynthesis, you're gonna record everything you know right, without looking at your notes, without looking at your textbook, just what do you already own on the topic of photosynthesis? Then you're gonna check yourself. How did I do? Now you're gonna go back to your course content material and you're gonna see, did I find, do I, do I have all the concept details I need in order to prepare myself for this exam? 
If not, if there's a few pieces you missed, you record them under the W side. What do I want to know? And when you are finished, you have a complete study page, expert page, which allows you to see all the details in one place that you need to know on a topic. These work great um, if you're fortunate enough to get a study guide with the main concepts um, for an exam on it, you can use any of these methods to go right down the topics on your study guide to make sure you have them thoroughly developed. The last thing I wanna talk with you about today are some specific exams that we see um, and some strategies that we can apply in studying for these specific types of exams. For multiple choice or open-ended, which you already probably have recognized are very common exams at Gettysburg. Any of the methods I just talked with you work great for these, the concept cards, the foldables, Quizlet, the KW organizers. The key again, read, write, talk, listen. The more up through the, sen the, the more senses you use to take in that information, the more likely you are to retain it. That is the name of the game. And you need to for completely develop your topics. You need to do the college level development of the information moving beyond simple definitions and facts to include all the information that will allow you to apply what you know to new situations on the exam in using the information that you have been studying and discussing in your classes. So <clears throat> any of those work great for the, your traditional multiple choice and open-ended exams. When we're looking at essay exams, uh, we, need, we wanna make sure that we are always studying consistently with how we're gonna be asked to perform on the exam. So an essay exam is obviously writing. You're developing your ideas and explaining them in the written form. If you know your topics, sometimes for your essay exams, you know them. Creating that outline is very simple because you already know your topic. It's a matter of developing it from your topic sentence with your main idea to include major supporting details and minor supporting details. If you wanna perform well on a college essay exam, you must include the minor supporting details. These are the explanations of the major supporting details. If you don't know your topic specifically, but you know it's an essay exam, you wanna look at the larger overarching topics that you continually come back to during a unit of study. If you look at these, these topics, you, you will be able to see, oh, okay, this is something we, uh, we keep coming back to. Everything connects to this big idea. Those are likely gonna be the kinds of things that you are asked to write about on an essay exam. Sometimes you get a study guide. They sometimes essay exams may say, be prepared to write about this, 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 and this. We see essay exams a lot um, in history and some of your social sciences. The key is to develop an outline. Do get your ideas organized. Main ideas, concept development. What is it? How do I support that with the major details? and then explain those major details with refined development of the minor supporting details. Further explanation is required. I see a lot of times in, in sociology, students come back and they're like, I knew everything, but I got a D on this, on this exam, why? Usually it's because those minor supporting refined details are not there. Further elaboration and explanation is a necessity in, for success on college exams. That's why organizing and outlining those and that organized outline should lead you right into paragraph development. Some people, if they, especially if you know your topic, will actually write it out in a practice um, written response to just to make sure that they are connecting their ideas. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's a great strategy. 
another other exams that we run across are specific to math and science. Well, if we are going to study and practice in our the same way we are tested, then we must do the math. In order to do the math, you want to utilize all the opportunities that are provided to you. Homework problem sets are very common in math and science classes. Additional practice problems are often offered. If you are offered chemistry practice problems, they are given to you because they resemble the types of questions and problems you're going to see on the exam. Make sure you plan time into your schedule to do that. I've had many students say to me, well, I don't have time to do the practice problems. I'm too busy trying to keep up with the homework. The practice problems are there for an additional layer and you really should be using them as they are provided, not the day before the exam. So you wanna take advantage of those. Practice tests are often provided also. So you can see what a, the an exam will look like and actually go through the, the practice of taking one. If you're fortunate enough to have all three of these things offered, you should be using all three in a combination of them. It is important that you find out and you know that you're practicing the problems correctly. Oftentimes, there will be an answer key provided. There may be um, some PLA sessions that you can go to that you can find out if you're doing the problems correctly. And if that, if not, and if you're not sure if you're, create, you're correctly approaching the problems and getting the ultimate correct answers, including all the steps in necessary, then you use your office hours that are provided legally by your professors to make sure that you are doing the practice for the exams in the correct manner. Practicing incorrectly is not gonna help you. So it's using all of these things that are made available to you and making sure that you are getting reinforcement on, the, on that you're doing the steps correctly and that you are ultimately solving the problems correctly as you go through the unit. Math builds, remember that. You've got to be able to have a firm foundation to build from step A to B, C, and so forth. So make sure that you are including that. Another um, thing, to, the last two I want to talk to you became extremely prevalent during the COVID remote learning situation. They're also still being used in our regular in-person classes, and I'm expecting to see a combination and usage of these two things also um, as we move into the spring semester. Take-home exams. Um, Take-home exams are very common in history, your social sciences, and they always have been. Take-home exams are expecting you to, to use extended time and extended effort. Your take, their take-home exams because there isn't enough time in a regular exam session during a class time of 50 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes in order to do the complete job that is expected of you by the professor. So the first thing you have to do with the take-home exam is preview it. You need to look at it and see what is expected. Take-home exams can range from four questions with a two or three paragraph response to three or four questions that are asking for a four to six page response for each. They vary widely, know what the expectations are. Then you need to think about how long, how much time you're gonna need in order to effectively complete these expectations or meet these expectations. So then you need to be thinking about when is it due? When do I have to have it submitted? And where do I have time in my schedule? to fit in the time that is necessary for me to successfully complete this take-home exam. Make a plan, schedule for the completion, and then the most important step is follow or implement that plan. That is always the most important. The time commitment will vary greatly from class to class on that. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about that became very, very common during the remote learning is open note and open book exams. And I saw these were still happening last semester. 
um, even though we were in a regular classroom situation in person. And I expect, as I said, to see this trickle into uh, our spring semester as well, as well. Open note and open book exams are all about preparation. They very often have the same time restraints as an in-person exam. Sometimes I've seen them last semester where you had an open note or open book exam in the in the in-class testing session itself. So it's really important here that you organize yourself. You need to go through and prepare your reading notes and your class notes, make sure they're consistent, make sure they're married together in an orderly way. So once you have all the materials gathered and they're organized, you should use divide uh, topic dividers so that you can access different topics quickly. The post-it notes that I'm holding, the smaller ones, they're great for this. You write your topics, anything that you wanna be able to access on the, on the um, post-it note, tear it off and pop it down into your textbook or your notebook. So that marking the topics so that you can find them quickly and easily. You do not wanna lose time because you're digging for information. Unfortunately, People often think, oh, this is gonna be so much easier because I can use my notes. These are not tests that have the answers just blatantly sitting there waiting for you to find them. This open notes and open books are used for you to provide a background of information for you to apply to the testing situation. So again, knowing where the concepts are are important for you to be able to access it in a timely manner so that you can continue through the flow of the exam in the time allotment that is allowed for the exam. Um, this really concludes the portion of what I wanted to share with you today. I want to make sure that we have time, as I said, for our three distinguished um, and experienced college students on our panel so that they can share with you some of the things that they have learned and from real time as a student at Gettysburg College with some of the challenges that you may be facing yourself now. So um, Cole and Chris and Colton, if you wanna remove your mute button, uh, mute buttons and camera blocks and so that we can see and hear you, that would be great. And if you don't mind, Cole, we'll start with you. We'll just go kind of go down the list. Yeah. And, okay. So uh, I'm Cole. I'm a junior at Gettysburg, and I'm a health science major and also a member of um, Greek life, and I'm on the rugby team. So my freshman year, I came into Gettysburg, and I still implemented the same study strategies that I used in high school, and uh, this didn't work very well. I would just glance over my notes and material like, a day or two before the exams and I didn't put in any adequate time to academics and this was mostly due um, to just an like in organization that I had um, I didn't stick to a schedule or anything I just kind of tried to fit um, my academic time around other things that I wanted to do and I procrastinated a lot and that was one of the biggest issues was just um, stemming from the fact that I didn't really have a schedule that I used um, and I still do some of these things, but they're not to the extent that I used to, just because I've been more intentional with my study strategies. Um, as they said, it's really important to have a comfortable place to study. Um, not comfortable in the sense like you're in your bed or in your room or something, but a place that you feel comfortable that you can put in um, a decent amount of work and you can stay focused in that area. Um, the biggest thing for me with this is just trying to limit distractions. So like staying off my phone and making sure I have everything that I need for um, the amount of time I'm going to study for, like my books, pencils, like a calculator, if you need it, anything like that. Um, so you don't have to go back to your room or get up and it interrupts your study time at all. Um, the biggest thing for me that has changed my overall academic performance, I'd say, and my study strategy ability is um, budgeting time. So I use a planner and I do monthly and daily schedules. For the daily schedules, it's a little bit looser than the monthly schedules. It's just like a checklist or something. And I see when I have pockets of time throughout my day um, and just try to be intentional about using those pockets of time to get what I want to do done. Um, and then implementing new study strategies is also a big part of 
what has changed my overall um, progress on my academic side of things. Um, I've used Quizlet a decent amount. Um, they have really good strategies like Sharon was talking about just for organizing um, different concepts and making connections between concepts. Um, rewriting notes in your own words is another thing that's really helped me. So like I go back after a class or something and I add on to notes like Sharon was saying and um, try to paraphrase what the professor was saying in my own words. I also do this for textbook readings. It's really important to read the textbook and make sure you're going to class and everything because there's things in the textbook that might not be addressed in class and things in class that might not be addressed in the textbook. And um, because of this, it's important to make connections between concepts that are taught in class and in the textbook and make connections between different assignments in a class. Um, this helps make the material more cohesive and gives you like um, the ability to have a deeper understanding of the course material. Another thing that's really important is office hours, as was mentioned. Um, I didn't really go to these a lot my freshman year. And as I started realizing that I needed to change something. I um, started going to office hours and the biggest benefit for me from office hours is just the professor sees you're putting in effort which can change your grade from if you're like sitting on a C plus it can make your grade go to a B sometimes in some cases um, just because they saw that you're putting in that effort and it's good to go over the information a second or third time especially from the professor's standpoint they might add different things that they didn't say in class or give you hints for like an exam or something um and then again not waiting until the last minute not procrastinating is really important um scheduling your time out and being intentional makes it easier to do this um and a thing that also is important with not procrastinating is the study loop as was mentioned so it's a lot easier to touch like a material or a subject for 15 to 20 minutes a day than it is to cram like two or three hours the night before an exam. Um, outline, outlining your assignments for the semester can really help with this too because you see when your busy times are and you can use the non-busy times to take advantage um, and get ahead on work. And for me, the biggest thing that has worked, as I said already, is just emphasizing organization in every area of my academic life and um, as well as studying and sticking to the organizational patterns that I've come up with. So that's just what has been a successful for me. Thanks, Cole, you did a really great job. Chris, you wanna pick up um, behind that? Yes, sir. Um, hi, I'm Chris Giacomo, a senior at Gettysburg on the football team. I will share my document right now and I will, oh, sorry. Um, all right. I want to thank uh, academic advising Hannah and Sharon, and Sharon for allowing me to share my experience regarding my personal development of effective work and study habits. So <clears throat> from early on here at Gettysburg, I struggled with creating effective work habits and study strategies. And thanks to Sharon, we have found ways to overcome these strategies with some rather simple but effective habits. Time management was the root of my issues. So we introduced the idea of a planner which had the, had the times of the day or 24 hours and good habits are crucial. So the best way to start this up was to put in my hard times, like sleep, classes, practice, gym time, food, and other important commitments. And on the side of my planner, I would write down all the must do's for my classes and extracurricul extracurriculars and fill them in my schedule. So this allowed me to find better use of time to study so I wouldn't become overwhelmed. And uh, finding the best place to study is difficult because you may like the library, but it can sometimes be overwhelming and not fair to others if you like to study out loud. And also it may be distracting studying in your room, especially if you have a roommate. So what worked best for me was to find a building that had many rooms which weren't being used, which also gave me close access to my professors at the time. Since I'm a health science major, the science building had plenty of rooms that allowed me to study on my own, but also work with others if needed. Some obstacles that I had to overcome in order to find the best academic habits and strategies that worked best for me were in, when planning my schedule, I needed to face the fact that there is a time for socialization, phone time, social media, free time, hanging out with friends and other distractions. And then there's a time to focus on my studies. So having a time planner and breaking down my responsibilities allowed me to create time in my schedule to have free time for stuff like that. It took some maturing, but breaking bad, my bad habits of doing things on the fly without a plan and not having a solid understanding of my priorities, what allowed me to overcome some obstacles. Focusing on your studies 
and doing well makes the free time and socialization that much better because you don't have the worry and stress of missing an assignment or not studying for a test hanging over your head. Thanks, Chris. Great to hear so many of the things we've talked about <laughs> used in there. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay. Does anybody um, have any questions at this point? Or are we ready to go on with our third student? Okay. I'm not seeing anything in the in um, coming up, so we'll go on to Colton. Yeah. Um... Hello guys, um, I'm Colton Ward. I'm from Maryland and I'm a first year here at Gettysburg. Um, I also play on the soccer team here, so I'm also a student athlete. Um, yeah, I think that, that that Christopher and Cole brought up a lot of the things that I was going to share. Um, but I think, uh, I think the first one I'll start with that was pretty common was just separating uh, just socializing and studying um, is I think a pretty big factor um, in influencing how good you do in um, school. And like Cole and Christopher were saying, just limiting distractions, finding a good study space. Um, like in the morning, I go to Cub, um, the, sec the second floor of Cub in the morning, because I know it's pretty quiet um, and there's usually not many people up there. So I would go there and then then I would have my bio class. So I would just go from the Cub straight, straight to bio in the morning. And that really worked well for me. So if I needed to get any any just last minute homework assignments or just readings in, then, um, then I have the time to do that. Um, and then second, um, I would just say, it's, I feel like it's a mindset thing. Um, I feel like just for me personally, I feel like that doing like your homework or quizzes um, is kind of a, all like a culmination of, um, of, of studying, um, even though as we all know, it's, on, it's ongoing. Um, I feel like just having that mindset that 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 your homework and that your quizzes that you're doing is in preparation for your tests, and so just having that 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 idea and that that thought um, just helps me kind of process that, that studying. Um, it's not kind of all in vain, but also just being just determined and confident in yourself, despite how hard or difficult the material um, is or or can be. Um, I think a lot of people are rooting for you, and, um, and I think that that you yourself should be one of those people too. Um, and then another thing that I recently started using um, is an app called Pomo Focus. Um, it's, it's basically a studying tool that, that helps you kind of um, break, break up your, your um, I guess, time in terms of doing homework or studying. So like you, so you can set a timer um, for, for, let's say like 20 minutes or 25 minutes and you'll just focus on just doing your homework or studying. And then once that timer uh, ticks, then, then you take a five minute break. So you, you can do whatever you want. Um, just take a five minute break just to get, get your mind re reset. And then, then once the five minutes is over, you just go back to, to, to that 20 to 25 minutes, just doing just hard, um, just studying or, or homework. And just, you, just doing that, um really really helped me um it eased a lot of stress and, and anxiety um in doing homework and not and just making the process uh i guess the load just lighter um especially during finals so um if you want to do that i'll i'll send the link um in the chat but um but also another thing i do uh, in terms of note taking is that i color code my notes um i, I can share my screen to show you guys what i mean but um, essentially, it's, um, I color code my notes. So like this is for my math and for here, um, I, I try to make the note take taking process a bit, um, I guess fun in a way, not, not dreading it. <laughs> um, as you can see, my examples are kind of, um, isn't like an evergreen kind of color. So I know that, hey, like, if, if I don't understand this part of the material, I have an example in which I can go to. So um, I think that that'll really help just making the process a bit more entertaining and not kind of dreading the class or, or the note taking process. So uh, this is a part I looked forward to um, when I was in math, but um, I think that that's another um, just process that I think will really help in terms of studying and kind of organizing your mental thoughts. But um, I know that there's, 
a lot more and I don't have much time, but uh, I would just say a last thing is just using the resources that are available to you. Um, I think that Gettysburg just does a really great job in providing a lot of resources and a lot of the resources are free, which is the best. So um, in my short time here, I've used a lot. Like I go to, um, in the beginning, I wasn't really going to a lot of PLA reviews, but but now I go to, to, uh, to, to, every, to every PLA review that I can. Um, and just going and just having a relationship with my professor, just asking them as many questions as I want or need. Um, the English Writing Center is a great, great, great resource. Um, they, they've helped me create outlines like Christopher and Cole have said, and, um, and just online, just practice tools. Um, if I don't understand some things, I'm a visual learner, so sometimes I go to YouTube if I need to type in something to understand, but um, yeah, just using the resources that are available to you um, is another great asset. So um, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks, Colton. Those are some of the most beautiful notes I've ever seen in my life. And I love that you said that it makes it fun for you. You can find ways to make any of this pleasant and enjoyable for yourself. Go for it. That is absolutely what you should be doing. Some really great information, Hannah. Yes, thank you, students. I think um, pretty much what Sharon and I and all three students all had to say is that all of these strategies do take time to implement, right? This isn't something you can do just overnight. They take time and it really starts in that first week. Um, the concept cards work great if you leave them in your notes, not if they get scattered everywhere. But each day when you're reviewing your notes, you can make one of those in your notebook. And then that is you studying for that first exam. Um, and I know um, I've seen Colton here working in, in the Cubs. So he definitely does that before class. Um, I think that's how we met too, Colton, um, seeing you study on a regular basis. But I think that is what it's all about. It's not about just cramming things in at the last minute. Um, and it goes back to the habits. It becomes a habit that this is what I do between classes. This is what I do before class. This is what I need to do after class. Um, and we learn them as we go, like Cole and Chris said, you, they didn't come in knowing all of these things. So it's okay not to have figured it out yet, but this is you figuring it out. And you coming today is a great sign that you're willing to do that. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, Sharon and I, and maybe even the students will stick around if anyone wants to stay and ask questions. If you have anything for the good of the group, you can certainly stay and share it with all of us. Otherwise, thank you for coming and good luck with your spring 22 semester.